Good evening, everyone. I'm Lainey Brown and the editor of this anthology of Forest on Many Stems, Essays on the Poet's Novel. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this event. Special thanks to everyone at Kelly Writers House and the Creative Writing Department, and especially Jessica Lowenthal, Julia Block, and Zach Cardner. And I also wanna thank Nightboat Books and the artist Noah Satterstrom, who made the beautiful cover art um, on this book. And also just all of our amazing contributors, the readers here tonight, and all the contributors in the book. It's really been such an amazing ecstatic reading experience and, and correspondence experience with all the contributors, these brilliant poets through the long evolution of this book. I'm speaking to you tonight from my home in Wallingford, Pennsylvania, ancestral lands of the Lenny Lenape people whose presence and resilience in Pennsylvania is continuous to this day. We take this opportunity to honor the original caretakers of this land and recognize the histories of land theft, violence, erasure, and oppression that has brought our institution and ourselves here. With gratitude for all of the locations and caretakers of these locations from which we are currently listening and residing. I also want to shout out to Mary Tassio at the Common Press, who made a beautiful commemorative broadside for this event. And because we are virtual, she will mail those out to the first however many people um, respond and that information will be going out in the chat. And the organization for this event is as follows. Um, a very brief intro to the project by myself and then I will give brief introductions of all of our readers tonight and they'll present in alphabetical order and then after that we'll have a short question and answer period, and you can send in your questions in the YouTube chat. So I thought I'd introduce this anthology tonight by reading really briefly from an illustrated talk I gave titled The Poet's Novel as a Form of Defiance in Determinate Frame, which is now a book from Kin Press, it's also a collaboration with the artist Noah Satterstrom, who made about a dozen uh, illustrations for the talk. And it's really um, speaking to my initial fascination with the form, which began long ago. When I first arrived in New York City in my early 20s, I associated the novel with a never ending series of rooms. In contrast to poetry and the studio apartment I shared, but this was also a lie. The novels I loved might have no rooms. If the task of the writer is to create a habitable dwelling for the reader, then poets created lean-tos and structures of air. This is all wrong. Yet, I include these thoughts to offer the mythos of the novel that I brought with me to the page. Poetry was electric. Poetry I could read at night and become more and more awake. Prose enabled sleep. To open a novel was to enter one's apartment, hang up a coat, kick off shoes, and lie down with only the company of characters. This is known as reading, but reading poetry was another beast or another way of wrestling. Reading poetry was walking out into an unknown corridor in search of one's beloved, wearing a coat and nothing beneath. You are very hungry and have not slept for a week. With care, the text will feed you. You carry collage supplies in one hand, cooking implements in another, with one's third and fourth hands, several stacks of books, 
garbage, debris, homeless inhabitants, strangers, disembodied voices, dying landscapes, news feeds. Take this entire series of scattered images and arrange them in the palm of your hand. This was reading poetry. You could recite, but at the same time, you took it apart. Maybe that's just how a poet reads poetry. I expect a reformulation of sense through a process rarely immediate. I never expect to be on solid ground or within reliable gravity. Alice Notley writes in an interview, poetry tends to abolish time and present experience as dense and compressed. Prose is society's enabler. It collaborates with it in its linearity. A poem sends you back into itself repeatedly. A story leads you on. In prose, I always thought I could promenade, walk distinctly in a line from one location to another until I discovered poet's prose or prose which behaved as poetry. Poets were always writing in this vein, but the work was mostly ignored. When I began asking poets about writing on poets' novels for an anthology I am editing, a common response was, the poet's novel? Does such a thing exist? So that's where we begin. The poet's novel, does such a thing exist? And luckily tonight we have some brilliant poets who have some wonderful thoughts on specific novels written by poets. So our, our readers tonight will be Julia Block, Rachel Blau de Plessis, Marcella Durand, John Keane, Jenna Osman, and Brandon Shimoda. And I'm going to read uh, brief bios for all of them right now, but I wanna invite you to please, please explore their amazing spectacular work, which is voluminous and far more than I can indicate in the, in the short bio right now. Julia Block grew up in Northern California and Sydney, Australia. Her most recent book of poetry is The Sacramento of Desire. She is the recipient of the Joseph Henry Jackson Literary Award from the San Francisco Foundation and a Pew Fellowship in the Arts. And she directs the creative writing program at the University of Pennsylvania. Rachel Blaudeplessis has just completed a book length critical study called A Long Essay on the Long Poem. Forthcoming is her selected poems, 1980 to 2020 from Chax. From 1986 to 2012, she wrote her long poem, Drafts, beginning in 2015. Her Traces with Days is in progress. Marcella Duran is the author of to Husband is Too Tender, Black Square Editions 2021, The Prospect, Delete Press 2020, Area, Belladonna Books 2008, and Traffic and Weather, Future Poem 2008. She is the 2021 recipient of the C.D. Wright Award in Poetry from the Foundation of Contemporary Art, Earth Horizons, her translation of Michelle Metal's book-length poem, Les Horizons des Sol, was published by Black Square Editions in 2020. John Keane is the author, co-author, and translator of a handful of books, including the poetry collection, Punks, New and Selected Poems, The Song Cave, 2021, and the fiction collection, Counter Narratives. New Direction 2016. His awards include a 2018 MacArthur Foundation Fellowship. He teaches and serves as a department chair at Rutgers University, New York. Jenna Osmond's most recent book of poems is Motion Studies, Ugly Duckling Press, 2019. Other books include Corporate Relations from Burning Deck in 2014, Public Figures from Wesleyan University Press in 2012, The Network 
Fence Books in 2010, selected for the National Poetry Series, an essay in Asterisk from Roof Books in 2004, and The Character, Beacon Press winner of the 1998 Barnard New Women Poets Prize. She teaches in the MFA Creative Writing Program at Temple University in Philadelphia. Brandon Shimoda is a Yonsai poet, writer, and the author most recently of The Grave on the Wall, City Lights 2019, which received the Penn Open Book Award and The Desert, The Song Cave 2018. He co-edited with Tom Donovan, To Look at the Sea is to Become What One Is, and a Tell Adnan Reader from Nightboat Books in 2014. His book, on the Afterlife of Japanese American Incarceration received a creative nonfiction grant from the Whiting Foundation and is forthcoming from City Lights. Wow, I'm so thrilled to have all of you here. Thank you so much for being here. Um, please help me in welcoming all of our readers tonight and beginning with Julia Block. Thanks so much, Lainey. And what a treat to be presenting at tonight's event. Um, one of the joys of writing an essay that becomes part of a larger collection is that you get to revisit it later, like later after you after you wrote it um, and reconsider it in light of new thoughts and new energies that are created by the constellation of other authors that you're dwelling with in the volume. So that's kind of what I decided to do in terms of approaching what I wanted to say tonight. So I'm gonna speak a bit about that poet's novel and what I had to say then and what I have to say now. So Lainey opens her introduction to this brilliant anthology with a quote from Lynn Higinian. And Lynn writes, I must oppose the opposition of poetry to prose. And as I was getting ready for tonight's event, I was actually thinking about another Lynn Higinian quote. And this is from The Rejection of Closure, that incredible essay about the open text. And here's Lynn speaking about the composition of one of her own works. She writes, my intention was to write a lyric poem in a long form to achieve maximum vertical intensity and maximum horizontal extensivity. To myself, I proposed the paragraph as a unit representing a single moment of time, a single moment in the mind, its content, all the thoughts, thought particles, impressions, impulses, all the diverse particular and contradictory elements that are included in an active and emotional mind at any given instant. For the moment, for the writer, the poem is a mind. So I'm thinking about this quote a lot these days because the novel that I wrote about for the anthology, Maud Martha by Gwendolyn Brooks, is a poet's novel, but also because Brooks's long poem, Annie Allen, is a little bit like a novel and is also a lyric poem in a long form. And here I have to pause to thank one of tonight's speakers, Rachel Blau Plessy, for introducing me to that long poem in graduate school, which led me to the lyric novel, Maud Martha, and led me to Laney's capaciously thrilling multi-genre book of commentary and criticism. And I love Lynn's idea that for the writer, the poem is a mind. And I'm interested in how she says, for the moment, like the poem isn't always a mind, but it is for the moment or for a moment in time or on the page. It's a momentary thing, but also an ongoing one. It's for our moment, it's for this one. When Brooks's novel, Maud Martha appeared in 1953, it was described in the New Yorker as a hopeful piling up of small details. And this critical fixation on small details, you see it a lot in writing about Brooks's work. And I think it betrays an assumption about the supposed smallness that characterizes her poetic language. The novel is built out of details that paint a portrait of post-war Chicago and offer what Margaret Rhonda describes as phenomenologies of urban habitation that detail urban restructuring and geographical conscription of black neighborhoods along with their accompanying environmental effects. And the character of Maud Martha appears at times herself as a kind of detail. At one point in the novel, she's 16 years old. She attends a concert at Chicago's Regal Theater and she reflects on the performance. She imagines alternative visions for what her own creative efforts might entail. Brooks writes, to create a role, a poem, picture, music, a rapture in stone, great, but not for her. What she wanted was to donate to the world a good Maud Martha. That was the offering, the bit of art that could not come from any other. 
she would polish and hone that. So Maud Martha imagines herself as a bit of art, good rather than great, or maybe not necessarily great, rendering herself into detail. And these details of self-description accumulate and the novel starts to forge implicit parallels between the racist norms that Maud Martha encounters outside the home and the massages norms inside it. And she talks about form later in the novel as the disconnect grows between her desire for intimacy and the drudgery of housewifely service. Brooks writes, what she had wanted was a solid. She had wanted shimmering form, warm but hard as stone and as difficult to break. She had wanted to found tradition. She had wanted to shape for their use, for hers, for his, for little Paulette's, a set of falterless customs. She had wanted stone. So we get these words, solid, form, stone, found, shape. Maud Martha's desire has gone from what she wants from art to what she wants from life. And the novel becomes a critique of the forces that would shape and hone the self and what we're able to shape and hone of ourselves. The poem is a mind. And for Brooks, this also meant that the poem had something to say, not just about form, but about everything else. For Brooks, form was the social. Sometimes Brooks is discussed in terms of this radical break in her practice from the honed lyricism of her earlier work to the socially engaged poems that she began writing after encountering the Black Arts Movement. But like that divide between poetry and prose or between the lyric and the long poem or between form and the social, these distinctions, they never hold up. In 1967, she talked about her practice with an interviewer. She said, the poet, first and foremost an individual with a personal vision is also a member of society. Starting out usually in the grip of a high and private suffusion, I may find by the time I've arrived at a last line that there is quite some public clamor in my product. And then in 1969, she said, I've not abandoned beauty or lyricism and I don't consider myself a polemical poet. I'm a black poet and I write about what I see. Kevin Quashie says that Maud Martha is about the search for self in human terms. When Maud Martha tells the reader that she would polish and hone that like a small luminous detail, I'm thinking a lot about the polished honed forms like the sonnets and ballads that Brooks wrote in her many earlier poetry collections or the intricate modular paragraphs of Maud Martha or the clipped free verse lines of her later books like In the Mecca or Riot and what they have to teach us about how the poet's mind is always polished and honed and at its best forms the kind of public clamor that we seem to need right now more than ever. Thanks so much. Do I just start? I think I will. Poet's novel is a paradoxical phrase joining a type of writer to a genre of writing. It's an oxymoron like prose poem, a mode of writing linked to its opposite in genre. Both are examples of a, of a resistance to firm and walled definitions of genre, mode, type, style, forms, a resistance pretty much the condition of any literature, in my view, which seeks many combinations in historically specific shapes. Hence this survey, Laney's survey of mainly contemporary US poets novels under the rubric, does anyone know what a poet's novel is? Not least because many modern novels like Joyce, Wolfe, Conrad, Hurston, Proust, Barnes, apply various techniques of poetry to novels with all the elements of the poetic in play, whether you'd consider this imagery Rhythmist, discursive variety like heteroglossia, pensive, interiorized writing, the poetic, in scare quotes, quick transitions, jump cuts, whatever. Ours, ours, that is contemporary ones, seem to shorten these novels. Okay. This, what follows, is a riff on my essay, just as sort of with, as Julia did, funny, interesting, beyond my essay. So the poet's novel seems to depend on the general reader, us, having a general understanding of words like poem, poetry, poetic, but a bit cliched, like a hazy day of 19th century poetry before you actually wake up and figure out what was happening there 
And um, poetic is also a word that's used for everything from Cy Twombly in the Philadelphia Art Museum to Benetton ads. So like, what does it mean? I wish I knew. And such a general reader also has an understanding of a novel, plot, ending, also all cliched versions of 19th century and contemporary genre novels, like many detective stories, you know, beginning, middle, end, solving a problem. It's really updated Aristotle, although he was writing about plays. We know even as we hold these cliches, that both of these understandings are only pleasantly functional and cliched. So Poet's novel takes our own internalized cliches about both of these things and playfully, seriously, intentionally overturns and undercuts them. It's like you as a reader are a walking embodiment of Derrida on genre. Simply put, and this is the very simple Reader's Digest, small version of Derrida, only part of his essay on the law of genre. There is no single genre, no cliched poem or novel, just stuff floating in discursive fields, perhaps, I don't know. But senses of genres are constructed in a comparative and plural interaction with each other, including the cliches. That is, genres are ontologically hybrid, by their very being of genres, they are only formed in temporary or functional interactions. Every text participates in one or more genres, but never belong to any. So participation is what he says, and I would just say interactions. So genre, to paraphrase or do something with this, is not a thing. It's an analytic strategy or event. That's like the quantum theory of genre. So we only know genres in some measure by these unsophisticated cliches that we're simultaneously embracing and strategically undercutting. I chose Gertrude Stein's A Novel of Thank You, which does not call itself a poet's novel, but I was not then bothered. Maybe I should have been more. It was written in 1925 to 26, not published until 1958. I say it's a meta novel, a novel on the beyond level, because it claims to investigate the novel. Stein said, who can think about a novel? I can, a typical Steinian, um, it's almost a boast. In its structure, it's a joke allusion to three volume novel. Part one is super, super long, parts two and three risibly short. Plot, a multiple, multiple allusions to all kinds of plots, zero follow through, on any named plot. Character, they're stagey names that they turn into empty pronouns and they function indexically like numbers. Time and development, what we were being talked about, talked about before, equally empty. But, and this just slays me, the theme, Stein tells you the theme. After all of that, like, no, you're not gonna get any of this. She says, this is the theme. They were glad to see each other. In other words, the novel is nice, polite interactions. It's literally a novel of thank you and you're welcome. And the beginning and ends of visits without development of character, event, or even the reason for the visit, pleasantries, inane, pointless interactions. So why is it a poet's novel? Well, this is what I didn't really say. It's sort of poetry's novel. It has lengthy, unusual, non-compliant passages of rhyme. Now, for everyone who's a code breaker out there, rhyming prose is a last taboo. It might sound silly. It's inappropriate. It's sing-song. It calls attention to the materiality of sound, often without a corresponding sense of statement. It can be near doggerel. And I will just state, this is a very white remark because the caveat is unless you are writing uplifting essay sermons in which pr rhyming prose is used all the time, like talk the talk and walk the walk, or curiously and interestingly, an apology to, in today's Philadelphia Inquirer for their really wretched efforts to um, deal with African-American citizens um, for the long history. This is a quotation, the judgment of our efforts will not be based on the promises we make, but on the actions we take. So with every um, 
the statement here that it's that it's in doggerel that sign is in doggerel can be um, referenced by a few examples, but it doesn't mean that rhyming prose is forever and ever doggerel. That's an interpretive remark on the occasion. Okay, let me just telling that she went away and to stay, telling that she went away so that they might say that she had not gone away right away, telling that she had today to go away as she had to stay anyway. Sorry, that's not, um, that's my, or will they send us money? Will they lend us? Will they lend us? Will they send us? Will they send us honey? And there are any number of other passages like that uh, sort of sporadically, um, you know, sprinkled around this thing. So she thinks about a novel, Stein thinks about a novel by abstracting and emptying some of its main traits, character, plot, event, development, time, and structure. You know, the usual stuff you talk about when you talk about a novel. And she turns the prose of the novel, turns, deturns, um, by sometimes, but not all the time, writing passages of doggerel rhyme that are taboo in prose. Thus in this novel, if considered a poet's novel, which is kind of a question, um, you, by these uses of poetry sound is perverse. That's the word I use. It is for verse, by means of verse, and it twists the concept of both nice novel and nice poem in a hypernormal pleasantry way that comes out sounding deviated. Um, it, science normalcy is generally deviated. And um, some thoughts um, on reading, this is like stuff said in the anthology. Other people say perverse for poet's novel. Some say androgynous. Some say too poetic to be a novel, too novelistic to be a poem, which is like how the cliches work. You put them out there and then you turn them around. Um, words like hybridity, bricolage, and both and recur, also oscillation, contrarian and resistant, also non-normative, subversive, also impure, proliferative. We like these kinds of words these days. They constitute our critical habitus. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel. That was um, mind blowing. Actually, <laughs> sorry. No, I, I'm digesting it, um, just thinking about how poets' novels and oxymoron, and and for me, it definitely was reading Robert Creeley's *The Island*, and um, just returning to this essay and and thinking about how, um, for me, this novel was like you you name these elements: character, number. Um, structure and in this novel there was so much character that was just a structure a poetic structure to me and and I ended up analyzing the numbers of it which I think kicked me off after writing this piece into a deeper investigation of numbers in poetry and structure in poetry rather than in prose and and the rhyming prose that's amazing that you found this quote from the Philadelphia <laughs> inquirer that is completely not poetry, even though it has the superficial elements of rhyme in it, but it's anti-poetry. So thank you. Um, but I, I think we're gonna discuss a little more afterward. We each sort of present, great, okay. Um, so I'm gonna read through this essay, the point of Robert Creeley's The Island. Even as it provides the title for what is simultaneously autobiography, novel, and long poem, the island doesn't address so much an actual island as the claustrophobia of being within a limited geography. It seems at first rather uncreely like this invitation to think of an island as a metaphor, the island being marriage or not even marriage, but the state of being an individual dealing with other individuals. Creeley's own introductory note inclines us to take it so. They want an island in which the world will be at last a place circumscribed by visible horizons. They want to love free of a continuity of roads and other places. I've found that time, even it will not offer much more than a place to die in, nonetheless carries one on away from this or any other island. And I just want to stop and just like tell you to pay attention to that one mention of one 
in um, Creeley's little quote there. But as in Creeley's poetry, a seemingly simple metaphor is never always that. Here's another quote. There is the sign of the flower to borrow the theme, but what or where to recover what is not love too simply, the rhyme from his book for love. The island in the novel is also a geographical actuality that intensifies the character's isolation and that geographical isolation heightened by cultural isolation from the island's inhabitants in turn intensifies the issues that drive the narrative forward. The main character, John, trapped by the island of his own existence turns inward, losing the ability to escape his own boundaries. Similarly, almost every encounter with the waters that surround the island turns close to mortal for those characters who swim in them, including his wife, Joan. Thus the island exists both as parallel metaphor and literal element. The island is intensely monoperspectival, which furthers the relation of island to individual, but also makes the novel difficult to read. I found it very difficult to read, suffocating even. Almost every action of the main character, John, is set in context with all his other actions, his emotions, and his past, and this often appears to become justification. So time, too, is a device that drives the novel and how incidents occur to affect what comes after. By some means or other, this demanded, a man must make of his narrative a cohesion of things there occurring must give them demonstrable relation. What is order of a kind, and we've gone wrong only in believing it is to be of one kind, no other to be admitted, Creeley writes in How to Write a Novel. So I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit in the essay and read from there. Um, at the same time, there's something else going on in this novel that speaks not so much to fiction innovation or innovation in fiction, but to what was really a detour from poetry in the life career of a great poet. What I find mattering to me is the poet behind the construction of the novel. That is the poet who wrote the poems of For Love that spanned the decade before the island's publication in 1963, and who after this novel returned to poetry and poems like Numbers, which was published in his book Pieces in 1969. What then poetically, I wanna know, is important in this break? Form is the extension of content, Creeley famously says. So as Marjorie Perloff has identified in her essay, four times five, Robert Creeley's The Island, the island has a form. Each chapter is approximately five pages within five chapters to four parts, five, five, four. His book for love includes the poem, The Names. When they came near the one, two, three, four, all five of us sat in the broken seat. Oh, glad to see, oh, glad to be, where company is so derived from sticks and stones bottles and bones. Creeley's famous quatrains and fine control over are an ample evidence throughout for love. But in this poem, the focus is on the syllables and the numbers within the syllables. Four, five, 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 four, 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 four. four. It's not one of the better known poems in the collection, but it's evidence of Creeley's sense of numbers within both content and form as oral skeleton, as linked to tradition that extends enough to accommodate his breaks with it, as the percussion most organically echoing the body and breath's own length and sound. Form here is the natural number of the human body and it accommodates the others within, the structures within language that are human beings interacting with each other, even if with sticks, stones, bottles, and bones. In Numbers, a longer piece written for Robert Indiana, Creeley provides some insight into why the syllabic beats or stanza lengths of four or five in poetry may accommodate relation. And two by two is not an army, but friends who love one another. Four is a square or peaceful circle, celebrating return, reunion, love's triumph. Four, Numbers, Somehow the extra one, what is more than four, 
reassured me there would be enough. Twos and threes or one and four is plenty, a way to draw stars. The structures of four and five can create a geometry that accommodates interaction and conversation within human scale. Problem is that this perfect poetic structure, the human quatrain, this beautiful form that extends the content of relationship doesn't actually work as well for the island. Instead, the four five five structure overlays somewhat uneasily content that is essentially the structure of one, the main character, John. The epigraph for the island. It is all one to me where I begin for I shall come back again there. That's echoed years later in one from numbers. What singular upright flourishing condition it enters here, it returns here. John's relationships with others are too ghostly or plural or faceless to create a dialogue. Moreover, the island's sentences and paragraphs of prose extend past the natural four or five feet of a human breath and often become overpunctuated, choppy, so very unlike Creeley's precise sense of line breaks in poetry. Here's a quote from the novel. The long car one had, had taken them all in, but he was left later, somehow, still unclear. He was running down the street after the fading image of it, trying to catch it, calling to her. To return to Four Love, as this book seems closest in time and intention to the island, I see that Creeley knows how to use and how to escape beautifully the quatrain and to compress and stretch the line into and past the breath enough to become exhilarating. From the rain. Love, if you love me, lie next to me. Be for me like rain, the getting out of the tiredness, the fatuousness, the semi-lust of intentional indifference. Be wet with a decent happiness. Four and five transform to 13, nine, two, seven. But in the island, there is no such escape, not really much transformation. It is what it is. And so I look for the form more suited to this content and find the island not only metaphor, but structure itself and how it holds the situation of the novel. It is solitary, it is irregular, it is mute and not mutable. It too is one. So thank you. Thanks so much, Marcella. That was wonderful to hear you talking about Creeley. Happy Black History Month to everyone. I want to thank Lainey Brown, Kelly Writers House, Zach Carduna, Nightboat Books, all of my fellow readers who are all amazing poets and all attending tonight's event. Thanks so much for being here. I'm going to actually uh, read a little bit from an essay I wrote on Fernando Pessoa's Book of Disquiet. And I was telling uh, my um, uh, MFA workshop, fiction workshop this past Monday. This is a book that uh, both mesmerizes me and exasperates me. Um, it is an amazing book on so many levels and also a book that, you know, I have time on the reading and I just want to throw it across the room. Uh, so I'll try to give some reason, some sense of, of why uh, I, I feel this way. I'd also say uh, before I start that uh, one of the people, one of his uh, great, the great translators of uh, Pessoa's uh, Book of Disquiet, Richard Zenith, actually published a 1,050 page uh, biography uh, called An Experimental Life. It came out uh, from Liverite and uh, this past year, and it'll be out from Penguin in 2022. So if you really want to delve into Pessoa, uh, you should do so. I should say I've read some reviews of it, and it sounds like uh, he uncovers all kinds of uh, interesting and sometimes shocking things about uh, Pessoa that most people don't know. Um, and the other thing I was going to say is that the, if you want to read the Book of Disquiet, there are a number of versions, and you should you know pick up any of them. But I want to particularly recommend the Book of Disquiet, the complete edition, translated by Margaret uh, Jewel Costa, uh, published by New Directions, edited by Caronimo Pizarro. Um, because that, I think, is um, probably go down as a definitive uh, uh, issue, uh, a definitive version, pardon me, in, um, in English. So let's get started here. Um, okay. 
So I'm just going to read, as I said, little snippets of, of this essay. In the brief sections that, I, that follow, I will offer to aim, I will aim to offer a few thoughts about how to read the Book of Disquiet, Livro um, Desasosego, um, Book of Disquiet, in different ways that underscore a small portion of its literary significance. Its repetition of effects produces a tedium. And this is what I was talking about. It's, it's exasperating in a, in a way. And it is, to put, mildly, put it mildly, a book of almost unrelieved narrative tedium, undercut with cyclical accounts of psychic distress. Right? This doesn't sound like anything you might want to read, but I'm telling you, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a, a very charged and mesmerizing novel. The narrator highlights this when he speaks of, quote, a tedium that contains only the prospect of more tedium. Yet Priscilla produced, or was in the process of producing, a novel that can stand as an exemplary work of Portuguese, European, Lucifone, and global modernism. The Book of Disquiet also is a harbinger and forerunner of postmodernism, a profoundly poetic uh, anti-novel, eschewing most, if not all, of the component scholars and critics of the novel tend to associate with that genre, even as it represents a model for the lyric novel and later developments in autobiographical and memoristic nonfiction, and it's a paradigmatic account of psychological depression. Pessoa's novel, whether this was his explicit aim or not, unsettles the very categories of genre of fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and perhaps like Arnold Schoenberg's great unfinished contemporaneous opera Moses und Aaron, could never be fragments fully short against the gathering ruins in industrial capitalism, which is to say never completed because it's intrinsic conceptualization and nature made completion, at least by the author, impossible. And I will say that Pessoa dies in 1935, and I believe a, a full edition of the Book of Disquiet does not appear uh, until 1982. So I'll just read little uh, snippets of each of these. So this is a postmodernist novel. Anonymous, prolix, unfathomable present. Inasmuch as the Book of Disquiet's formal fragmentation brands it as a key text of modernism, it's incomplete despite the complete stamp that appears in various translated editions. And I just mentioned one, right? Uh, form and structure can also be read as emphasizing process and openness. Simply put, the text demands the editors, translators, critics, and readers active participation. And many, one thing I'll say also about this is it's very interesting. Uh, in the original Portuguese title, it's the Book of uh, Disquiet uh, for Bernardo Soares. Uh, Bernardo Soares was one of the heteronyms uh, or, you know, kind of um, personae that Pessoa used to write uh, some of his poems. And he had, I think, like over 80 of these, and actually maybe more, but I think I... Uh, found um, one statement that there, there were eight different personae that wrote his poems. And some of these personae became actually quite famous. Um, so he actually you know, labels one of these uh, personae as the author of, the, uh, of this uh, text. But then once you go through it, you start to realize, and there's other, you know, a number of editors sort of figure this out, that a number of these various personae or heteronyms actually are um, writing this book or you know, behind uh, particular moments and passages in the book. Indeterminacy is one of its guiding principles linking it to the postmodernist turn that would occur only a few decades after Pessoa's death. As already noted, there is no final or authentic version because Pessoa, despite the marked envelope, left none. He had an envelope, you know, saying basically this is the book of Pesquire. And any assembly of these fragments, let alone reading, uh, could constitute a corrupt one, as well as a possible misassembly and misreading. So out is Pessoa, Ironically underlines this when he notes, quote, the only true art is that of construction, right? Going on to add that the only thing in which construction plays a part today is the machine. The only logical argument is a mathematical proof, unquote. Echoing both the early modernist Ludwig Wittgenstein of the Tractatus and the later proto-postmodern Wittgenstein of the philosophical investigations. The narrator models and thematizes the conduct of construction throughout the text. It leaves the onus on those who follow to see it through. Okay, and I'll skip ahead. The ineffable quote, this is the quote, the ineffable poetry of those sentences, unquote, a poetic anti-novel. If it is true that a good deal of European and American modernist fiction dispenses, dispenses with some of the conventions of fiction of preceding eras, it is nevertheless also the case that it also often retains 
fundamentals such as characterization, plot, pacing, tone, voice, theme, and structure, even as it transforms them. Pessoa, steeped in experiments of then contemporary literature, as his essays have become the new Portuguese poetry indicate, nevertheless issues all these fundamentals in what became his entry into the genre. Beyond his narrator, he dispenses with character altogether. His boss, the narrator, this is the narrator's boss, his boss, Mr. Vashkish, the object of the narrator's fascination, fascination and desire, the office boy, in quotes, who heads back to his village, co-workers co like Moreira, are all nothing more than cardboard stand-ins for the figures so Adish interacts with daily. We get no sense of them as people, as living beings with personalities or inner lives. Instead, as Pessoa himself noted of the work, its solipsism is autobiographical, with but a few details and past incidents to flesh out scenes, to anchor the narrative and what we think of as reality. Telling is the mere total, total absence of dialogue. And this is very fascinating because it's like this endless stream of commentary, but there is no dialogue in this novel, except of an idealized or apostrophized kind. He is not the man without qualities, as in Robert Musil's eponymous unfinished 1943 novel, but he is the man for whom little occurs beyond the pedestrian outside the offices of his mind. And then, so I'll jump ahead. This is another quote. I only suffer more, a novel of depression. Though psychology as an academic and professional discipline existed during Pessoa's lifetime, our contemporary understanding of psychological depression did not. I thus hesitate to initiate such a reading in relation to the Book of Disquiet, which despite its exploration of psychology is not a psychological novel, for fear of imposing a potentially reductive present day medical diagnos diagnosis on a past work of art or diagnosing a character whose social and cultural context differ, differ from today's in a variety of ways. A focused exploration of Solaris' entries might nevertheless lead a reader to conclude that alongside a spiritual and metaphysical explanation of narrator's anxieties, he is also negotiating and recording a sustained emotional crisis. Additionally, rather than obscuring the psychological challenges, the trauma he lives with, his lyrical descriptions, descriptions manage to amplify recognition of them. The spiritual sickness and the unrelenting disquiet which Pessoa abode, uh, avoids psychologizing by recourse to Sigmund Freud or similar figures, who of course would have been uh, big and who he would have known of, known about, and which Suarez professes, almost like a refrain, map onto DSMV-4's criteria for major depressive disorder, MDD, even if imperfectly. The narrator expresses, quote, decreased interest or pleasure in most activities, unquote, quote, changes in sleep resulting in insomnia, quote, fatigue, unquote, feelings of, quote, worthlessness, unquote, and even thoughts of self-annihilation. So Iris's diurnal accounts of his existence often present a poetic version of what the DSMV-4 outlines, employing day and night as tropes for his impression. And now I'll go back to a modernist novel. Quote, how modern all this sounds, unquote. A modernist novel. The Book of Disquiet is at first and repeated glance a collection of fragments. This formal quality, coupled with the era in which Pistola drafted the novel, immediately mark it as a modernist text. The carefully constructed realism of the preceding generations, exemplified by Pistola's Portuguese predecessor, José María Esa de Queiroz, as well as the symbolism of European counterparts like Maurice Metalin, yields to an approach to the novel melding experimentation in both form and content. Pistola's lack of instructions or even implicit guide for assembling the novel died. Uh, the, the novel might suggest sloppiness or a haphazard plan, but as the novel's narrator states, the aim was to collect impressions rather than produce a representative novel, even a modernist one. Bridget Zenith argues that, quote, the Book of Disquietude, which is another uh, translation of uh, the Portuguese, uh, should be published in, loose, in a loose leaf edition, permitting the reader to order and reorder the fragments according to the dictate of his or her own his or her own intuition, much as B.S. Johnson would do 35 years later with his 1969 novel, The Unfortunates. This is not to say that Pessoa offered or imposed no order whatsoever. In addition to the distinctly Geddish and Suarez text, and Geddish is another one of the heteronyms, 
fragments he wrote in and around the last decade of his life were sometimes chronologically marked, while these and others were numbered, aiding editors in constructing possible narrative sequences. Pessoa's clues can be found in the continuities and shifts in narrator's voices, moods, implying thematic and narrative centers and movements. And so one of the things that last thing I was gonna say is this, it's, it's fascinating to read this novel and its various versions because it really is like playing in a sense a kind of um, game, right? To try to assemble and figure out, uh, in the sense we have a kind of guiding consciousness, but the more you read it and the closer you read it, the more that you, the more you pick up these different currents, uh, these different uh, uh, voices, these different moods, right? These very some, often just slight tonal shifts. And it's really a quite remarkable book. So that's why I'm saying that on the one hand, it's mesmerizing because it really, it, it can become almost entrancing. On the other hand, of course, you know, it is extraordinarily tedious at times too. So I urge you to, to if you haven't read it, to check it out. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, I want to start by thanking Lini um, for all the work that it took to bring this anthology into the world and for figuring out how to organize this uh, impressive array of materials. Um, my essay is on Talia Fields' novel, Ululu Clown Shrapnel, and it's in the section of the anthology that's titled Portrait documentary representation palimpsest. Um, preparing for this event, I noted that my essay follows one that's written by Vincent Broca on the work of Stacy Doris, uh, a close friend of mine who um, passed away 10 years ago. Um, I met both Stacy and Talia uh, in my early and mid twenties. Um, and their charismatic intelligences and their genre busting poetics changed everything for me. So I'm gonna share my screen and show some images to go along with this. Uh, uh oh. See my screen? Yes, okay, thanks. All right. Um, so I chose to write about Ululu because I was scared of it. It was epic and I didn't even know how to pronounce the title. Um, Field started working on it in 1994 and it was published by Coffee House Press in 2007. By 2012, when Lainey approached me about contributing something for this anthology on the poet's novel, I hadn't yet had the courage to read it in its entirety. Um, it's the kind of book that, um, uh oh, it's the kind of book that teaches you how to read it as you go along. Um, here's a close up of that page. Uh, it, the book collages the trajectory of a particular late 19th, early 20th century European character, Lulu. Although Lulu is clearly an archetype, nobody can seem to agree on what she represents. Is she a monster? Is she an innocent? A sexual predator? A reflection of others' desires? In all interpretations, she's a woman with power, but seemingly no agency, and her indeterminacy continues to be a point of fascination. So I'm going to quickly trace the history of the Lulu character in a linear chronological way, which is the complete opposite of what Field's book does, um, but is the quickest way to introduce you to this figure who continues to reverberate in the cultural consciousness. 
The Lulu character made her first appearance on the cultural scene in 1870, when a young acrobat appeared in European theaters as the beautiful Lulu, the girl aerialist and Circassian catapultist. The beautiful Lulu astonished crowds as she was catapulted from under the stage to a trapeze above by a complicated contraption. Until 1878, when a stage accident revealed that Lulu was actually a young man named El Nino Farini, AKA Samuel Wasgate of Maine. Inspired by Lulu the Girl Aerialist, as well as the Commedia dell'arte stock character Columbine, novelist Félicien Champsauer created a pantomime in 1888 called Lulu. In this performance, Lulu is a dancer whose lost heart is discovered by Arnold Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer is determined to understand how the heart works, but Lulu tricks him in giving it back to her. She then hands it off to Harlequin. The German playwright Frank Wiedekind saw Schampsauer's pantomime and it inspired him to write his Lulu plays, Earth Spirit and Pandora's Box. The plays tell the story of a woman and her many relationships. Each man and one woman turns Lulu into a personification of his or her own desires. She is Pygmalion's creature, shaped by each person that touches her. As the torrid events of the play escalate, and as each lover meets a gruesome fate, Lulu seems to have no emotional response. She lacks a moral center, and in that way reflects the corrupt culture of Vedekin's era. The story does not end well. Lulu is ultimately murdered by Jack the Ripper, who was kill killing prostitutes in London in the same year as Wiedekin first saw Schampsauer's Lulu. After Wiedekin's play premiered in 1895 and 1904, respectively, and were subsequently censored, Lulu's proliferated. First in the silent films of Leopold Jessner, and this is a uh, still from Erdgeist from 1923. And then um, in G.W. Pabst, Pandora's Box from 1928 that starred Louise Brooks as Lulu. And then in the 1937 opera Lulu by Alan Berg. Talia Fields Lulu continues the chain of adaptations but her version puts all prior renderings in conversation with one another. Thus, Field's novel functions as a cultural biography of a character, taking all of Lulu, all Lulu's interpreters into a multi-form account. Now, I don't have time to go into the mind-blowing plot of Lulu or how Field blows it apart, but it holds a lot of secrets and you'll have to read Field's book and maybe my essay to learn all about them. Uh, I'll close here by saying that at the midpoint of Berg's opera, there's a silent film that's rarely presented in performance. And the film portrays Lulu's imprisonment, illness from cholera and jailbreak. And it serves as a kind of bridge between the plots of Wiedekind's Earth Spirit in the first half of the opera and Pandora's Box in the second. Um, let's see, Field uh, represents the cinematic transition point with film stills by Bill Morrison above her captioned text. And these stills are from Morrison's film, Light is Calling, which works with a deteriorated print of the 1926 silent film, The Bells. And what I'm going to try to do now is play, just to end, is to play a tiny bit of the film and read a little bit of the text that go along with these images. Um, and this is going to require me to do some fancy footwork here. Let's see if I can figure this out. Um, okay. All right. So here we go. Just as it happened, 
up from the depths. Columbine cuts on movement, the only character without a mask. Cash, the visibility of cuts, homogenous space, an ostinato abyss of strict retrograde, new traces of an old dance. Mercury vapor tubes bounce sunlight for a close-up, incandescent soldier. They have nothing solid to cast shadows. Mechanical arms pull civilians forward across the light, forgetting that characters get stronger behind the camera. The dust of Egypt ever since Eve, passion's playground, the lure of the mask, kiosks bulge, tomorrow's layer coming soon. Men sprocket untrenched and women pull the wounded into department store shelters. Dust on the film hides rack marks of an old reel. A panicked blackout, get as lost as you possibly can. And I will stop there. Um, should I jump in? Jenna, I'm inspired by you saying, I chose to write about you, Lulu, because I was scared of it. Um, now that's what I want to do. I want to write about things that's, that scare me, but I guess I need to figure out what it means to be scared first. Um, Thanks so much to everyone. There's so much to uh, process and what everybody has shared. I'm so grateful to be in your company. And thanks so much to Lainey. I guess, has it, yeah, maybe 10 years ago, the invitation went out to write about someone or, or something. And I was just finishing, I think, or maybe I was still in, in, the, in the middle of um, editing this, massive project of uh, writing by Atala Gnan. And so I'm grateful, I'm a grateful 10 years later for the invitation to actually think about um, what that work is through thinking about her book, Paris When It's Naked. And now I'm especially grateful because I have a place to go, not only to connect with her, but also to connect with what I was thinking about um, at the time that, that we were friends. So I'm gonna read, um, the final three paragraphs of the essay that I wrote about it tells Paris when it's naked. And then I'm going to read a little bit from her book, Paris when it's naked. Um, my essay is also in the section of the anthology that Jenna mentioned, portrait documentary representation palimpsest. And the section begins with an epigraph by Keith Waldrop's light while there is light. And it, and it goes, I've read many stories of revenants and apparitions, but my ghosts merely disappear. I never see them. It is nearing midnight in Paris. There is a bowl of oranges on a dining table. We are sitting in an apartment one block west of the Luxembourg Gardens. We have just finished dinner and are eating oranges. At one end of the table before a wall of tall windows is Atel Gnan. I ask Atel if she feels at home in Paris, which is maybe not the same as asking if Paris is her home. What is the difference? One can feel at home anywhere, and I suppose that makes a home of that place. One can, for example, feel foreign to one's home, where they live, but then that is not their home, but where they live. Atel lives full time in Paris. In her apartment, she is surrounded by windows and books and art on the walls, a lifetime of articles of travel and what she's working on, the people she loves. Throughout Paris, when it's naked, Atel's heart hangs over the sea, purifies in fog. There is no use living in Paris when all one cares for is the sea, she writes. She is tempted always to leave, her mind running furiously to distant places. She says she does not feel exactly at home in Paris. And when I ask her where she does, she says Beirut and Marin County, California, which are in some phases certainly works represented by the Mediterranean and Mount Tamalpais. 
In what ways have these been distilled in this present location that is not merely a present location, but the fulcrum of a life against which two very different worlds continue to evolve? I spend little time with the individuals I love, Attell writes in Of Cities and Women, and never live in the cities that matter the most to me. That's the way it goes. We talk about her work accumulating and evolving over many decades, her relationship to her earlier work, and of the archive or the archivist's impulse to collect the fragments of life and work for purposes external to it. The archive suggests a relationship to death Attell does not possess. It is an illusory approach to mastering death by proliferating the materials by which the self might be ordained or preordained. The archive is a function of religious fervor. Is it faith? Paris is an archival city. It views itself as complete or believes in the possibility of establishing of itself a total view. Perhaps it is not external. Isn't writing or any act of creation, therefore, a similar approach to mastering death? The poet is already the archive. One begins at the point of death. The series of increasingly complex forms that is the world creates a counter archive. The counter archive institutes a tremendous distance between the point of death and the invention of the soul. Poetry dispels in part that distance. It becomes instantaneously through the form poetic consciousness takes a poem, a novel, a book, a living paradox. What is created is a voluminous error being an imaginative, therefore fictive fragment of consciousness, including consciousness measured broadly across people and places, as well as the ultimate successor of it, by which all people and places either choose or choose not to abide. In the infectious bemoaning of the demise of the book and the ongoing debate on what constitutes one, the technology that seems to be suffering the most amazing decline is not the book, but the human being. The suffering is a matter of distance. The demise or extinction of the relationship between the human and their ability to maintain and evolve alongside the technology that is proven by the fact of history to be infinitely more durable and lasting is precisely the demise or extinction of the human. What does the poet impress upon memory? The poet is the transcendence of the technology. That is a possibility. What comes out is the evidence of consciousness or maybe the other way around. Only books will remain. Paris, when it's naked, is in part a testament to, to quote Kobo Abe, bounded infinity. What we have are working propositions. It tells, open out into life until they become ours. I have walked many dozens of circuitous miles and cities on all sides of all waters and have felt the movement to be a poem. I have exiled myself from those cities and miles and have felt I am revising the poem that once was. It returns where consciousness, consciousness meets itself within the ensemble of forms, withdrawing and asserting itself as a book being continuously written in correspondence with life. That is, as Attell writes, living in one's mind like the turning center of everything that is. And this is Attell from Paris when it's naked. Let's be direct. You think about death. And what is death? Disappearance, I should say. A magician's trick. Here's the handkerchief. Here, is it, here it isn't. No, it's something else. It's inbuilt in life. But that doesn't say what it is, it being the end of life. Death is not a fact. It's a judgment passed on a fact, accompanied by pain or rather by fear. Fear of what? Fear of death. I sit in my cafe and keep reflecting, pushing here and there. In Southern Morocco, the cactuses have grown, but I'm back in Paris for sure. The sky is here, luminous with, again, much silver in it and freshness. Ideas and the weather go hand in hand, each modifying the other. The light is scaled down fractions of, of a degree and we sink with it in the sky's grayness. A cloud moves east 
we recognize that, recognize that is going away from the sun and our heart tightens, gives up on a thought that was approaching. We're never who we were. I'll be daring and order some beer on an empty stomach. But what is death? Life is so silly and formal around here that I can't ask my neighbors. What is it? It is the breakdown of unity, of the ultimate unity of the self. This breaking down is death. Death started with time, not with life. Life was. That moment when death was not yet existing gave birth to time, which means it gave birth to its own death. So death and time are interchangeable. Death is another name for time, and that will be my salvation, at least for today. Thank you. Amazing. Um, I just want to thank all of our contributors. This is just spectacular. We've gone through so many amazing works. Um, and I wanted to, we have a few minutes for questions. I wanted to start with our contributors who are here tonight to ask of each other any questions. And, and we can also take a look at the chat as well, um, invite questions there. But does anybody, any of our contributors, have questions to start. I actually um, would love to know whether writing a specific poet's, no poet's novel did something to the poet. And Marcella sort of hinted that this was true, um, that, that something changed in Creeley, maybe but it's not very clear, and, you know, it, it doesn't, I don't mean Marcella wasn't clear, I mean, it is not very clear. When I wrote on Barbara Guest for something else, I decided that she'd written one poet's novel to commit herself totally to poetry after that. And I just wondered whether anybody else had a, it doesn't have to be the same answer, it's sort of like what that question, why did they write them? That was definitely a question I had with the island that it occurred between two books of poetry that were so powerful and it, it was a strange outlier um, in his work. And, you know, I think there was something where he discovered something about structure and got the characters out of the way in a way or was able to move away from an autobiographical interpretation perhaps to a, wider, deeper understanding of relation within words and numbers and structure. It's a great question. Anyone else? Jenna? Well, I just was going to say that I am not sure that the question applies to Talia Field. Um, she's someone who self identifies as a fiction writer. And yet, so many of her books are categorized as poetry, you know, like for the bookstore categories. <laughs> um, and when you read her works, um, it really doesn't fit comfortably into either category in some ways. In fact, this book, I think, moves towards performance and theater. Um, so why so it's not like an exception for her. I think all of her works are kind of pushing against these categories. Yeah, I would just add, I mean, I can't remember the exact Eugenian quote that someone mentioned, but, you know, sort of the poem is a, is a mind, is it sort of thinking about, you know, um, a number of uh, the, the presentations today, and then just thinking about this marvelous anthology, uh, Marvel's presentations in this Marvel's anthology. I mean, one of the things that starts to become clear is that in in these novels, right, or other sort of fictional, quasi-fictional prose works, even for poets working in prose, the this form becomes another way, a way 
towards another kind of thinking or a, you know, not always a refinement of their thinking or a transformation of their thinking, but it takes them, allows them to go into, in, in a direction that is sort of often parallel or kind of corollary to what they're doing in, um, this sounds so antiquated verse, right? <laughs> right, but, but the poetry, um, but it, it allows them to go in a different direction, usually in a narrative direction, but not always, which is so interesting, you know? I was thinking of, um, you know, uh, Maud Martha and Annie Allen, and I mean, even the parallels in the titles, right? They're both, you know, these, these named figures. Uh, and there's, there's, um, uh, uh, you know, just a resonance, you know, just in, 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 in both of the, both of the works. But in one is decidedly a novel, and the other is decidedly poetry. But, but they do sort of speak to each other. And I think in the, in the novel, and I, I didn't write about Brooks, I, I love her work, you know, but just also thinking about Pessoa, you know, with the Book of Disquiet, or Book of Disquiet, and those, all those heteronyms, it, it's a, it finds with the space to gather things together. But in a sense, he sort of also explodes the, the, the strictures of uh, poetic form. It's a great question. It's one that I thought a lot about, and it it's so various in the different books. Um, sometimes the material demands a different form than the poet's been working in, and it's just a natural continuation of exploration of many different forms, including prose. Um, sometimes I feel like it's a way of corresponding with the poetry, getting a little distance from it. And then many of these books, as, as Jenna was saying, they just, they don't fit in any category at all. And that's one thing that I was so interested in um, because nobody was writing on them. So again, to echo Jenna's point, like, oh, I wanted to write about it because I was afraid of it. You know, I really, I was really curious about this form and nobody was writing about it. And in fact, some of these novels many of them, I wasn't really aware they even existed by poets I loved. Um, they were out of print, you know, nobody was talking. And they're just, they're brilliant, but they're just so strange and, and unique. And so I feel like that's, in a way, it's synonymous with being a poet is to do something that doesn't, that doesn't fit into a category. Or that's one thing that a lot of poets continue to be interested in is to, to write something that it's different than what's been written before. Anyone else have another question? Uh, Julia put a question in the chat about dialogue, which I thought was really interesting. How many of these novels have, how many poets novels have dialogue? Does anyone have thoughts on that? Um, Barbara Guests definitely does. Um, Stein, it's it's all talky talk, you know. But I I um, saying this is a poet's novel when all of her writing is a kind of writing. It, it was a stretch. That's all. The word poet's novel and a, a novelist's weirdness. I was going to say just quickly. I think Julie was in part of my comment Pessoa and the lack of dialogue in uh, the Book of Disquiet, and it is fascinating because I mean it's a it's it really is a book about a kind of radical interiority. But what happens when you just pretty much live completely inside your head? You don't talk to other people. So of course we know from the from from the descriptions of his daily life that he clearly interacted with other people. But I, it's it's just so fascinating. It's like you know. What do those other people have to say, other than you know, your reported uh, accounts of them? So it is. It's, it's sort of interesting. I think you know, may, maybe maybe part of it is this. You know, not not all these books, but certain certain of these novels, right? A kind of radical interiority that goes even beyond you know what we usually expect um, in you know modernist and postmodernist uh, fiction uh, of a more conventional type, or even more experimental type. 
think to have dialogue, you have to have characters. And to me, like poetry and characters, that that's, and when I read fiction, that's always the most troubling element to me in a way is that the character, the idea of creating this character is, is strange to me as a poet. You know? And um, yeah, I was curious to hearing each of you speak about what you thought about characters that it's a, a character of one uh, how much I mean so many of these verge so close to autobiography like uh, I think I had never thought of Etel Adnan's Paris when it's naked it's a, a novel before like somehow I had not taken it as a novel right so I'm curious about that like what elements all of these pushed so hard against genre that just really pushed hard and, and seeing the film I think really that pushed against even what a film <laughs> was in an amazing way so. definitely stretching is happening at the instances I'm thinking of that have dialogue do something very baffling with dialogue like um uh nests of ninnies Ashbur Ashbury and Schuyler's collaborative novel there's lots of dialogue but it's very not expected dialogue or it, it can't be read in the way that dialogue often can be read in a novel um and similar that then if we have some oftentimes we have like a first person narrative as in hilda hilst again it's not it's not a transparent uh first person in, in some ways it is but it's, it's not at all I don't know how to be more articulate than that um maybe John has thoughts you've done you translated some of her work um and I'm thinking of Narbezi Philippe's um searching for Livingston that's first person again it's not well, it, well one thing I was thinking about I mean as you were as you were talking weighing in is, and just hearing what other people have to say. I mentioned Ludwig Wittgenstein and, you know, one of the things that comes up when I think of him in relation to a lot of these works is the idea of a language game, right? I was saying, talking earlier about a kind of game, mm -hmm. uh, this sort of uh, thing now, sort of hypertext novel and things that sort of emerge in the late 90s on through to, thrown on through to today, right? You can just create all kinds of very interesting games, yeah, mortal, I guess, right? Uh, but, um, uh, but yeah, the, like the what are the terms of what are the terms that the novels these novels set down for themselves in terms of how to read them and interpret them? I think Jenna, you mentioned this right. You know how it it, it the how all the clown clown shrapnel um, it it provides you with a way of or ways of of how to read it, or how to understand it. But you have to sort of figure those things out. And so I was thinking, you know, um, maybe one way of thinking about someone like Hilsch is right. You know that it, on the surface it looks like one kind of novel. I'm thinking of both I've seen Madame D and Letters from a Seducer. On the other hand, you know, once you start reading, you realize, oh my God, what is going on here? Not just in terms of the content, but how do I read this? And you have to figure out how to understand the language game that she's, you know, kind of establishing for uh, for the work, which is a, which is a really extraordinary thing because it takes you to a different place as a as a reader, and if you're a writer, as a writer. There's a, a good um, comment in chat in the chat box, mm -hmm. which asks, um, are these novels crucibles for new poetic forms? I, um, you could check it out. Uh, Simon Eels, what new poetic forms do you see emerging from or experimented with in these poets' novels? Any, do they work like that as crucibles formally? I just, nifty, so I read it. Yeah, great. Does anyone want to respond to that? If they do, they do. If they don't, they don't. I mean, I don't know whether there are any new forms. There are just new combinations is what I was suggesting irreverently. I think that they ask for new relations with the reader. and. Um, 
I feel like all the elements, at least thinking again about Talia Field's work, like all the elements of fiction are there. There's character, plot, setting, all of them are there, but they are exploded so that you can't help but be kind of, you're conscious of these elements, of these fiction-like elements, but the way that they're combining and the way that the reader is being asked to work with them is completely foreign. <laughs> Um, so I think, and that's where, that's why I said I was kind of scared of the book. I mean, I had dipped into it numerous times and just felt like I, I was having trouble learning the language of it. Um, I was overwhelmed by the shattering of all the things that one expects, uh, when one reads a piece of prose and, um, Finally, you know, your invitation was the motivation to just be like, okay, I'm going to stay with it. You know, I'm going to stay with it for these however many pages, it's like 250 pages um, and kind of be in this world. And so that it becomes less alienating and more um, just uh, a world that I can interact with as a reader. And I feel like all of these texts are kind of asking us to rethink the elements um, and to kind of um, come up with some kind of a different way of meeting the text. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, I think that we welcome the shattering, right? As writers and readers, that's that's absolutely compelling. That seems like a great place to kind of wind up our, our talk tonight. Um, I just want to say thank you so much to all of our contributors who are here and everyone who's watching and everyone who's watching later. And just to invite you all to the world of all the books in the anthology, because it, it's, it's such a fantastic reading experience. I'm, I'm ready to reread all the books again, uh, which is just in incredibly pleasurable. And um, I'm really grateful for all of your contributions. So thank you. Yeah, thank all. you. <laughs> it all gave me so much food for thought. Wow. I mean, each presentation was like a different, amazing world of ideas and things to think about going forward. So thank you. Thank you all and good night. Thank you, everyone. See you soon. Thank you.